Welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show. It's sponsored by opinnews.com, available on Pacifica Radio Network, on Progressive Radio Network, on iTunes, on Stitcher, on SoundCloud. Uh, and I'm Rob Call. I've published opinnews.com, and I've got a, a new book out, The Bottom Up Revolution, Mastering the Emerging World of Connectivity. And my guest for this show is Danny Haifang. He is an activist and journalist residing in the New York City area. He's a regular contributor to the Black Agenda Report and the American Herald Tribune. Haifang's work was recently featured in Cynthia McKinney's new book, How the U.S. Creates uh, Blank Hole Countries. He is co-author of the book, American Exceptionalism and American Innocence, A People's History of Fake News from the Revolutionary War to the War on Terror. And and the best way to find him is at blackagendareport.com. So, you know, I I hesitated to say say shithole, but really if President Trump can say it, I guess we can say it. So the, the book is American Exceptionalism and American in- Innocence, a People's History of Fake News from the Revolutionary War to the War on Terror. And, and the, most of the book is really about American exceptionalism and American innocence, not so much about fake news. I have a feeling your publisher liked that title there. <laughs> but but it's, a, it's a great book. Yeah. It really powerfully at- attacks the idea of American exceptionalism. Uh, earlier, I, I did an interview with David Swanson, who also has a book out on American exceptionalism. And this is a very different one with a different take uh, that, uh, I, and I think the two of them together are very valuable together. And I know you were just on David's show as well. So yeah. let's start off by you def- talking about, you, you don't just talk about American exceptionalism. It's American exceptionalism and American innocence. So Define each of them and, and their relationship to each other, just so we can get all, all off to a start here. Sure. So American exceptionalism, uh, we argue, is the ideology that is offensive in character. It really seeks to explain, and this, uh, the oligarchs of the United States uh, really seek to explain the United States and its very character as exceptional as the best country that's ever existed, as the most democratic social order, as the arbiter of liberty, and ultimately as the model of civilization itself that has not been challenged historically or in the contemporary period. And so American innocence is really related to exceptionalism because what innocence does is it seeks to defend the exceptional character of the United States when it is questioned. So when people like yourself or uh, independent journalists, activists, uh, point out some of the contradictions of U.S. society, uh, American innocence kicks in to defend the exceptional character by writing off certain aberrations of U.S. history and U.S. contemporary politics for example, writing off slavery as something that happened in history, but ultimately was taken care of by the exceptional society, by the rulers who saw slavery as morally abhorrent. And so we argue that what this does is it ultimately tells all of us that no matter what the United States does, it is not only justified, but it can be forgiven. So the innocence part, just to kind of rephrase it, is basically the way that exceptionalism provides excuses and justifications so that people, see, even if they see all the wrong, all the violence, all the injustice, all the murder, and, and the slavery, and the, the, all those problems, they go, oh, well, yeah, but it's all for the good because... American exceptionalism. Exactly. And also what innocence does is it relies upon the need for a quote unquote other for an enemy. And that enemy, whether it's black people in the United States, indigenous people um, here on this land, or whether we're talking about people abroad and nations that the United States ultimately targets for war and destruction, uh, that enemy ultimately is pointed to as the worst of the worst and as the example which the United States is actually running from and ultimately trying to save 
And that in and of itself helps justify the crimes that ultimately comes from this ideology and the policies that are justified by it. Now, uh, you, you say in the book, because I want to cover the fake news aspect of it a bit, is that the history of US of the U.S. is a history of fake news. Yes. Can you explain that. Right. So American exceptionals and American innocence are really the ideologies that have framed how the, United, the history of the United States is told, but also how the United States' role in the world is narrated by the corporate media. And what we have seen over the course of history, and especially in this period where fake news is being used by the ruling class itself as something that's dangerous, what we're finding is that all that is, that is doing is reinforcing the reality of the situation, which has been that uh, the corporate media, our schools, the institutions of power in this country have consistently told us lies about the roots of the United States. Uh, they get angry that Trump says racist uh, epithets in his campaign speeches, but then are not willing to address the roots of where that racism comes from, the fact that the United States was founded upon white supremacy. We don't learn this on our history books. We don't learn that whiteness was really protected in the form of an American Republic. That was not something that I learned in school, and it certainly isn't anything that you can catch in the corporate media. And we can't connect how this history really relates to our current situation, where the United States spends trillions of dollars on wars and justifies them by dehumanizing people all over the world, by dehumanizing people, whether it's in the war on terror's uh, crusade against terrorism, ultimately terrorism that it created in wars like uh, Afghanistan in 1979. We're not taught these things. So you talk about the, the role of white supremacy and, uh, and how there's a lot of oppression that's caused by uh, American exceptionalism and American innocence. So ex explain that a little bit more. What's the connection between American exceptionalism and white supremacy? Right. So American exceptionalism is all about superiority, and it is a white superiority. Uh, the fable and the myth, the origins myth of the United States, ultimately was written by those whose very existence, uh, whose, whose very interest in uh, profiteering was rooted in slavery and was rooted in the dehumanization of Africans and the erasure of indigenous people in order to enrich themselves. And so the very narrative of American exceptional was rooted in that reality. However, you know, over the course of the centuries, what we've seen is that this has become an imperial ideology. It has become an the Thomas Jefferson since 1780 that the U.S. was supposed to be an empire of liberty, that it would spread uh, to the West, to the South, um, across the world as a empire that was rooted in the ideals of freedom and democracy, and it would rule in a different way. And you, you talk in the book about the idea that there's the myth that the United States is a force for good in the world. Exactly. Yes. And that's, that's really a, a key aspect and probably the most key aspect of our book, because we are really trying to argue that we need an anti-war and an anti-imperialist uh, movement. And, and that's why we wrote the book. And the framing of the United States as a force for good in the world is all about justifying war crimes, justifying this incessant need to occupy other territories and to plunder other nations in order to sustain an oligarchy, a global oligarchy where, you know, in the United States, we have three individuals who own, you know, more wealth than the bottom half. And that is a global phenomenon and that is sustained by endless war. And unless we challenge that, unless we challenge the ideologies of exceptionalism and innocence, we really can't confront it. So, you say in the book that American exceptionalism operates under colonial logic. What do you mean by that? Well, American exceptionalism operates again on the basis of superiority and it's rooted in the logic that there is a civilizing function of the United States and that what makes the United States exceptional is not only that it is the most democratic society in the world, 
but also that it spreads that democracy everywhere. And so that is really the colonial logic of American exceptionalism is its inherent need and the need of its narrators to prove to the world and to prove that it is the most superior society through the subjugation of others. I mean, that's how ultimately exceptionalism is born is by this nation to all others and by falsely claiming all of the institutions that have been erected, no matter the genocide, no matter the slavery, no matter the roots of the institutions, that these institutions ultimately are superior to any other that has existed and ultimately um, other peoples, other nations, other than, and we have to really clarify, that American exceptionalism is rooted also in Western liberalism and Western colonial uh, thought and practice. And so... Yeah. Yeah, and, and you say in the book that liberalism is deeply tied to exclusion, dispossession, and slavery. In other words, the right to freedom for some hinges on unfreedom for others. That's liberalism. I mean, I think most liberals don't think of the liberalism as being that, having those negative characteristics. How explain that? Right. So liberalism and classical liberalism is rooted in the origins of capitalism um, in Europe. And, you know, we argue that the United States is the um, foremost and most advanced capitalist society that has ever been born. And this capitalist society is ultimately rooted in white supremacy and white superiority and the ideas of um, endless warfare. And so ultimately we can't detach liberalism from that. What's happened and what American exceptionalism really does is it nationalizes these ideologies. It creates a cross-class unity that ultimately says that uh, the values of liberalism in free markets, the individual liberty are ultimately uh, applicable to everyone. But throughout the course of history and into today, we know that that's not true. We still have in the United States uh, a voting system that excludes Black Americans um, in high numbers. We have a highly segregated society. We have a system of incarceration that um, has locked up 40% of, uh, of its population as Black Americans, right? So we have this disproportionate racial regime, but we also have a system of utter and dire poverty that creates powerlessness for some, for many, and power for a few. What you're saying is un-American. It's anti-American. That's the accusation that people are going to make when you talk this way. Anybody who, who starts to discuss these kinds of ideas in these terms are going to be accused by the mainstream voice of America as being un-American. How do you respond to that? Well, there are many ways to respond to it. I think it's, it's not uncommon. It's not something I haven't heard before. We really have to stick to reality and, and a real analysis of, of the conditions and the history of the United States and how it relates to what we're facing right now. And uh, ultimately, this call to uh, you know, protect what America is all about is really a call to defend and protect what we feel are the interests uh, of this system. And so what American exceptionalism and innocence have done so ingeniously is say to even working class people, and we can talk a lot about working class whites, but working class people across the board, it has attached the interests of the ruling elites to the interests of the poor and the oppressed. And that is what we have to challenge. And so you know, if someone is going to call this book un-American, then we have to start to question whether being American is something that's desirable at all. If being American really means uh, four out of five people living paycheck to paycheck, if it means having the most people incarcerated in the world um, by far, if it means having a military budget that far outpaces the next 10 countries combined, if these are the things that make us American, then we have to question whether we want that at all. And okay, but wait a second. I, I, and, and I agree with you. I think you're right, but I think this is all about language and narrative and framing. So 
it's really important that you provide a replacement. Uh, I, I, on my email signature, I say the way that you change the world is you don't fight the existing system, you replace it with a better one. And so you've got to do that. And we've mm -hmm. got to do that. So what is the alternative? What are you proposing that we offer instead that people, that voters could look at it and go, yeah, that's better. That's really what I want. Right. So in the book, we talk about a lot learning the lessons, not only from what American exceptionalism is and justifies, but also what it erases. And that is the struggle. And, and you talk about this all the time, the struggle from the bottom up, the struggle from the grassroots. And there's a history involved in that. There are, there are, in the United States, we argue that the most progressive movement in this, in this country has always been the black movement, the black political movement. And there are histories in that movement we, there are lessons in that movement that need to be learned from. And I think if we're going to replace this system with a new one, we have to first ultimately challenge the powers that be that are going to restrict our capabilities of doing that. And we argue that one of the foundational things that we need, a principle that we need to ultimately adhere to in our day-to-day -day work is the principle of internationalism. So if we're building any organization, if we're building any organizational alternative, whether it's a political party, whether it's a labor party, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's a, a independent black political organization, it needs to be able to de-isolate the masses, the people from the rest of the world. That is ultimately what American exceptionalism has done. Has done. You know, it, some thoughts on it. Um, you know, and in the book, you, you, you specifically talk about the resistance and that it should focus on international solidarity. And when I think about that, what I write about in, in, in my book, Bottom Up Revolution, is we need to develop connection consciousness. I think that's a really core part of it. Uh, and when, when I think about bottom up, I think about how we're all connected to each other and we need each other. And we have to respect each other's needs and we have to respect the environment's needs. And American exceptionalism is kind of the ap opposite of that. It, it's basically an, an excuse for extraction and for domination and for conquest and imperialism, which is all the stuff I've taken from what you wrote in your book. And the alternative needs to be something that brings people together. Now, one thing that I think of is that American exceptionalism, and, and you refer to it, is so much of it is built on our military, on hard power, the ability to command, to force people to do things, both either, with either weapons and military strength or money. And I think that the alternative to that is soft power. Soft power is attraction. The problem is that, you know, you talk in the book about how 99.5% of the American cinema is propaganda that sells exceptionalism, that recruits for the military. So we've got to come up with new narratives. That's the solution, that, that one of the things that you refer to in the book as well. So what are the narratives that we need to offer that, that take us to this place of international solidarity and connection? How do we get there? What, and I know most of your book is about identifying the problem. Mm -hmm. I just really believe that it's really important to also see beyond what the problem is to where we're going and where we want to go. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, I, I think you outlined that really well. The, the narratives that we need to be in drawing are ones that are free um, of this lust, ultimately a lust for power and a lust for power based upon the relations of what the United States has always been about, which is capitalist relations, relations of white supremacy and empire. But those relations ultimately need to be detached from. So we need to unlearn what that really means because ultimately where we're going right now is we're going down the path of complete and utter chaos politically, economically. We see that the United States only has military solutions to help the world and really only has uh, austerity, right? Plunder, uh, 
tungsten in some prioritization. We need to begin to narrate a reality beyond that. And what that really means is we need to challenge the careerism, the notion of individualism. We need to begin to build collective um, ideological and political apparatuses that can sustain uh, ultimately what we talk about in the book, which is a real sentiment, um, a real sentiment of discontent right now. There is a lot of discontent in the political situation. Right, so we need to take a little break for a moment, all right? And uh, for the radio show, we've already done an ID here for the video, but for the radio show, I just pause for 10 seconds so I can plug in a bumper. And my guest for this show is Danny Haifong. He's an activist and journalist re who is a regular contributor to the Black Agenda Report, and he's co-author of the book American Exceptionalism and American In Innocence, A People's History of Fake News from the Revolutionary War to the War on Terror. So you talk about how there's dissatisfaction with our situation presented by American exceptionalism, and, and yet you... You say that there's stagnation and decline of American capitalism in the book. So talk about those things. Right. So they're very interrelated. Uh, this dissatisfaction right now is mainly economic. It has to do with the fact that in the United States, despite all the constant talk about how the United States is a superpower or how it is uh, the richest nation on earth, uh, the fact is, is that the vast majority of people are living paycheck to paycheck, four to five people. One in two are making less than $30,000 per year, which by today's standards is poverty in the United States. Um, the fact that, you know, uh, half the population can't afford a $500 emergency. And then we're talking about why that's happening. And there is a decline in the uh, U.S. capitalist system generally and how it is the leader of the global, so-called global economy. Uh, at this moment, growth has stagnated and there's all sorts of cooking the books about what that looks like. And Trump talks about we're growing and we're growing. But ultimately, since the economic crisis of 2007 2008, there has been what we call slow growth, what the IMF calls slow growth. And a lot of the reason for that is because, one, the United States spends so much on its military, and two, the population of the United States has become so poor what the United States produces, and it doesn't produce that much anymore. Um, ultimately, the world has become so poor because of US-led global capitalism. There isn't enough investment and activity being generated to maintain what the United States calls, uh, what the capitalist system calls um, a rate of profit that's increasing. It's ultimately decreasing, and the rich are attempting to run away with short-term profits as a way to uh, mitigate the effects of that. So here we're seeing a society, a system that is crumbling, um, even though there's a veneer, given the ideologies of American exceptionalism and innocence, given uh, the fact that uh, the United States is so misinformed about how capitalism actually works, how it really is sustained by the exploitation of labor. We don't, um, we're not feeling the effect, we're feeling the anger about it, but we're not feeling of the understanding of what it really means to be an empire in decline. And part of being an empire in decline too is not being able to dominate in the same way as you once could. There's the rise of Russia and China to the east. There's the fact that now US interventions are becoming disasters rather than being able to overthrow a democratically elected government and maintain control there. What we're seeing in places like Libya and Syria is failed attempts to do something that the U.S. has done for centuries, and an endless quagmire and an endless uh, war effort that is both costly and effective and ultimately doesn't generate economic benefits for most of the population, except for military contractors and uh, the few executives who own those. So that's ultimately where we're at in terms of the political situation. And, uh, you know, American innocence and American exceptionalism are being hurled at us by our elites, by especially the Democratic Party, in an attempt to ultimately distract and avoid uh, these crises, both global and domestic.
So let, let's just take a step back a little bit. And you, you talk about how the history of the United States is full of fake news that supports American exceptionalism. How, how, talk about that for World War II. Yes. So World War II is probably the, one of the most misremembered wars in the United States. Most people who lived through that period, um, and even most people who did not, uh, have learned that the U.S.'s role in World War II was justified and good in principle. It's one of the few times where, you know, the United States could say that. However, what we actually now know about the history of World War II is that the United States, not only prior to its formal entrance into the war, was financing uh, Nazism in Germany as the bulwark against Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union, but once it did enter, uh, it did so on the basis of its own interests. It, well, it, wait, wait. The U.S. was financing Nazism. What's your? That's a very strong claim. You need a right. strong support for that. What's right? The, right. So people like Prescott Bush, George W. Bush's grandfather, was a banker. He was a big financier of Hitler's campaign. Um, we also have Henry Ford was a big supporter of Hitler, and so there were many other corporations as well. Um, that ultimately saw this, that even though they might not I, actually, Prescott Bush and Henry Ford did identify with Nazism in a lot of ways. But even when there wasn't a formal identification with the politics of Nazism, there was an understanding, especially in the early 1930s, mid 1930s, that Nazism was useful to weakening the Soviet Union. And so that continued up until the United States began its Lend-Lease program and began to side with the Allies um, in order to build up its military power. That's what the Lend-Lease program is all about, producing weapons and producing a military might for the Allies in order to build up the U.S.'s economic infrastructure and military infrastructure in order to, once it did enter, become the superpower. That was really what the United States was interested in. It was expanding and amassing uh, profits, increasing the productive forces of the military, mostly, in order to ensure that the weakening empires of Europe um, and as well as Germany and the Axis powers, and it, that it would come out of the rubble as the top superpower. And that's exactly what happened. Okay. Now, one, I, need, I want to cover one other topic, and that's the politics of, the, of inclusion and how that is a bad news story. Right. So American exceptionalism in the 21st century has seen this notion of diversity explode, especially in the wake of the election of Barack Obama. We saw a lot of comparisons of Obama to Martin Luther King, to the civil rights movement, and we saw a lot of endorsements of this idea that it was great to occupy positions of power if you were an oppressed person, if you were um, someone who had been uh, you know, who had been the victim of historical injustices, that ultimately it was beneficial uh, for your whole people to occupy these positions of power, such as the presidency. What we find, and I think, you know, your work in terms of talking about bottom up um, is so important, is that ultimately what the politics of inclusion does is it creates a more effective uh, top-down structure in the United States, whereby um, through cosmetic changes, the U.S. empire, the military-industrial complex, the prison regime, uh, the, uh, the system of capitalism that exploits uh, workers and poor people, that can be more effective when it's uh, a black person running it or a woman running it. We see the corporate media talking a lot now. So basically what you're saying is the American exceptionalism system says, okay, we're going to get inclusive. We're going to allow people of color, we're going to allow transgendered or gay people to be in the military, which really is a way of increasing the power and influence of the military. Exactly. It doesn't change the fundamental social relationships of those institutions. It doesn't abolish institutions that ultimately, such as the military industrial complex, it doesn't abolish institutions that are uh, inherently criminal in, in terms of the harm that it creates around the world, what it does is it reforms them. And it reforms them in a way that's increasingly dangerous because we're in a period now 
I, I look, I usually just look at the response to someone like Bernie Sanders. We're in a period where the old, where the ruling elites do not believe it's possible to reform the existing structure to the benefit of people in a material sense. They don't, <clears throat> they don't want it. They don't want Medicare for all. They don't want uh, to fund social security. They don't want to end homeless. These are things that they don't feel they don't want to do because they don't feel like they can do without cutting into their profits. So I, and I think that the success of American exceptionalism, and I think American exceptionalism is phenomenally successful. I mean, I think even liberals and many progressives embrace it. Yeah. And they're afraid not to because then they'll be called un-American. So yeah. I think this is something that a huge percentage of the population it's the way they think. It's the narrative that, and the collection of stories that they base their perception on what is real and what is possible on, which is what, I mean, I'm getting this from your book too. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's a real challenge because it's not just the elite that think this. They've been very successful of getting most of the people in the United States to buy this. To, to believe it in their hearts that America is a great country. We are a great people. Our culture is wonderful. We should give this to the rest of the world. And what we're really giving them is empire and imperialism and capitalism that is extremely extractive and elite. And that doesn't really bring freedom and democracy. I mean, let's look at what's happening right now in Syria and Venezuela and what's happened in scores of other countries in the past. It's a, it could, they're trying to do it in Iran now, too. Yeah. It's regime change and takeover and, and installing of dictators who are friendlier to the United States, like we have in Egypt, for example. Yeah. And, and, and I think uh, Honduras, and, and I mean, it, it just goes on and on. And this is the wonderful America that we have. Uh, the, oh, we're bringing freedom, but to do it, we're going to give you a dictator. Yeah, exactly. And it is, it has been masterfully effective. And it does have a lot of influence over even how our political movements, how our social movements operate. I mean, we see that in the fact that even with the Sanders phenomenon, for example, with Bernie Sanders coming up, um, and he has such a mass base of support, and I support his policies of Medicare for All, I support his policies of student debt relief, all of those things I can support. But ultimately, it's what's left out, which just shows the effectiveness of American exceptionalism at work, where someone like him, who is posited as the alternative to the Democratic Party, can still remain silent largely on the military industrial complex. He had to be goaded by the New York Times. And as much as I give him credit for talking about his past history of standing up to US intervention in Central America, these are things that he wouldn't talk about openly unless he was uh, attacked by cold warriors in the New York Times who were calling the foreign minister and who were calling him an agent of Russia and socialism and whatnot. And that's the problem. I mean, you've yeah. got this mainstream media that serves this message of American exceptionalism. And that's a huge problem. I mean, because they will attack. I mean, if there's no way you're going to get on the mainstream media. There's no way they're going to give you a voice because you might get people thinking and that, that would be incredibly dangerous. And after all, you're un-American, anti-American, or at least, I mean, that's the, how they'll, f they'll label you. Oh, and, yeah. and, you know, so I, I, it gets back to that question of how do we change the narrative? How do we redefine the stories and the conversation so that America is a great country because what? Well, I think we, we have to narrate the story in our political spaces, in our organizations, in our workplaces, in our schools. It really has to start there because ultimately how American exceptionalism is so effective is by casting our gaze to the framework of the elite and to the, ultimately the social relationships that, that framework uh, defends and justifies. So if we continue to watch the corporate media, if we continue to 
um, you know, not challenge these ideologies in our spaces amongst the people, we're ultimately going to fall into the same patterns of reactivity. I think reaction has been a, a big characteristic of a lot of the discontent of even the last, since the Occupy Wall Street movement in 2011, we've seen movements sprout up, Black Lives Matter, we've now, you know, the Sanders insurgency, as Glenn Ford calls it, uh, we see these movements sprout up, we ultimately see them uh, pair out once the ruling class responds to them, right? So Black Lives Matter received intense repression from the FBI, and also there was a narrative that racism could be cleaned up through an act of national unity by coming together and condemning symbolism, condemning things like uh, statues in uh, Charlottesville, that this ultimately... Yeah, talk about, talk about these monuments uh, to the Civil War and what have you. Yeah. So, you know, uh, American exceptionalism is so dangerous and innocents are so dangerous because uh, when, uh, when there is this desire for social change amongst, let's say, uh, you know, anti-racist activists. Um, there's a response from the ruling class to turn that into a reform project that ultimately makes the system more effective and takes our gaze off of the institutional mechanisms of power. And that is exactly what happened during the Charlottesville, um, you know, development in 2017 when activists uh, were protesting uh, the uh, the there was a removal of the um, Robert e. Lee statue in Charlottesville, Virginia. The proposed removal and activists were protesting against. So in Charlottesville, Virginia, there was a protest uh, to ultimately get the Robert E. Lee statue removed after the United the Right rally sought to protect the um, monument to the popular Confederate uh, so, uh, general. And ultimately what happened in that struggle was that though the ruling class saw this as a problem, even Donald Trump said, oh, what are we going to do? Are we going to start removing statues of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson because they own slaves too? And so the ruling class saw this as ultimately a problem because narratives like that and where this could be going in terms of the roots of racism and white supremacy in U.S. society and how ultimately white supremacy is a barrier to class solidarity. It's a barrier to coming together as people who are being attacked by ultimately the same enemy. That was responded to in a very effective way, and that was through supporting the removal of symbols and statues of uh, what are seen as overt white supremacists, people who and it's slavery, like Robert E. Lee. So, Danny, it's been great to have you on the show. Uh, my guest for this show has been Danny Haifang. He is an activist, and he's a writer for Black Agenda Report, and he's the co-author of the book, American Exceptionalism and American Innocence, A People's History of Fake News from the Revolutionary War to the War on Terror. Danny, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks so much for having me.